welcome everyone to uh, the inaugural event in LexArt Inspires. This is a program that a number of our members, uh, led by uh, Molly Nye and Rachel Rosenblum, got together a couple months ago to brainstorm. Um, said, what, what can we do to keep our gallery alive and going uh, in the midst of the pandemic and have something that we think will be able to continue on even after, um, after we're forced, uh, our isolation is, is over. And uh, after a lot of brainstorming, uh, we said, wouldn't it be fun to talk to different artists? And we said, we wanted artists from different, uh, different pieces of the world, not just the visual arts, but uh, music, literature, poetry, and dance even. Um, and let's explore some themes that are common to whatever art you're trying to make. Um, and we kind of rallied around the idea of where does creativity come from? Um, what about perception, inspiration? All these things that are common to what we need to make art and also fundamental to our enjoyment of art. So we came up with that uh, concept and we're extraordinarily pleased um, for our, our first set of conversations. We wanted these to be provocative conversations and see if we could get good interplay, um, some harmony and some conflict all in the same conversation. And we came up with, well, what better way to find harmony and conflict than within a family? <laughs> so we have a great family of artists, Ronnie Gould, uh, the mat uh, if I may call you the matriarch here, the mother. She's uh, actually a former member of LexArt, a painter and ceramicist. Uh, her son, Ben, industrial designer and partner with his wife, Dawn Mastel, um, in Dawna Matrix, um, a high fashion uh, enterprise. And I'm going to just leave the introductions brief uh, with that and uh, turn it over to Ronnie just to um, get us started and she'll tell you more about herself and her artwork. So take it away, Ronnie. Yeah, thanks, Wayne. I wanna thank Lex Art for this invitation. It's a tremendous honor to be invited to be part of these series. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of friends here. I miss all of you so much, uh, but to be able to just see you even on the screen here is, it's wonderful. I think about all of you out there. I'm just gonna show you some of the work that um, I have been doing. Uh, for those aren't, who are not familiar with what I've been doing, um, I was a painter, started out as a painter, but uh, clay is what I felt like just fun. And I went, well, as an artist, it sh should feel like you're like, you're working really hard and you know struggling and all that. And clay is just too much fun. But I went, you know what? go have fun. So I decided to jump in many years ago and um, actually joined the Ceramic Guild because they were clearly having a lot of fun over there. I've been doing ceramic animals for a long time. Uh, doing pottery, it was, it didn't speak to me. I, I admire pots and I, you know, I think they're absolutely magnificent in what potters can do. Um, but um, somehow the animals were, was what was coming out of me. Um, I've done a lot of work um, just doing straight animals, but what I have enjoyed the most in my career is trying to express um, how I feel about what may be happening in the world. And uh, these these particular animals, and there was a whole series like this where they were on these pedestals, um, where the pedestals um, exemplify civilization. Uh, these animals are out of balance, they're having difficulty, and that's sort of what our impact has been in the world. Uh, so that was how this whole series came about. Here's another one, the cube. Uh, this rhino is coming out um, of this cube, trapped somewhat, escaping somewhat. Code Red certainly, you know, says that it's, you know, it's bleeding. Things are, things are difficult. 
Uh, but at the same time, I tried to make the work approachable um, and not too difficult to, um, in terms of concept. Uh, this one I did about a year or so ago called Daily News. This figure is actually coming out of the wall in the back. Um, and it's kind of how I was feeling. There was just constant bombardment of uh, what was going on in the news every single day. So I did this figure. Uh, this is a piece I did this year uh, called Hoarding. And when we first, when the pandemic first started, it was, and I kept hearing about people hoarding toilet paper. I thought this is so ridiculous. So these are actually animals that do hoard and uh, the fox, the crows, and there are several others. So I wanted to do this piece. Um, as I said before, I've done a lot of just animals. Um, I've, I grew up with dogs, loved dogs, and there are times in which trying to do something um, uh, based on how I feel about the world is not the best direction. <laughs> Going ahead and, and resorting back to what I love, which is just animals and dogs, just gives me great joy. And here's another one of Jack Russell. Um, this is, was a piece that I did um, and got juried into the um, uh, Contemporary Craft Museum in Pittsburgh for the Ensica uh, juried uh, in, in 2018. This is, um, you know, um, still feeling what was going on about in, in the world, um, in politics. Um, I threw all these people into a, a pram, which does not row very well, and they're all going in opposite directions not working well. Uh, this is a piece I did this year based on how we've been living, the social distancing, um, put us all in our separate boxes. Um, because of my love of animals and nature and my concerns about it, um, I like working with organizations that are on the front line of conservation. Uh, this is a piece that I donated to the to our local zoo, uh, Zoo New England. They have a big auction every year, um, and I used to think that zoos were, you know, really just locking animals up in cages. But the truth is that they are on the front lines in terms of conservation, and they do work worldwide with other zoos and on the ground, uh, bringing in endangered animals uh, back and doing their best. So. They're, turned out they're a great organization. Once I learned that about them, I've been, uh, I donate a piece to them every year. Uh, that was another one that I gave to them another year. They, it was their baby taper. And uh, a pangolin, which is the most trafficked mammal in the world. Um, unfortunately, we may be losing them altogether. So many years ago for the Lexington Arts and Crafts, this is still one of my favorite pieces and I have kept it in my collection, um, it's Circus Bear, where an animal is being used for our entertainment and um, especially an animal that should be in the wild. And that was part of the, um, uh, the, the ceramic skilled uh, show. Dogs again, love dogs. <laughs> So I have a, uh, a Raku kiln. Most of my work is done in the Raku method in terms of the final firing. And as you see, there's just all these nice crackles that I, that I can get with uh, some of the glazes. And another concept piece, Mother Nature in the Anthropocene era. Basically, she's not too happy and she's floating on all kinds of, you know, tires and things that we have tossed into our oceans. Anthropocene is the, um, the impact that humans have on the earth. And that's the era in which we are uh, living in now um, with climate change and uh, loss of habitats. It's, it's what our impact is. So that is, has been titled that, that this is the era, unfortunately. And I think I'm done. Great. Th thank you so much, Ronnie. Uh, before we uh, go on to 
uh, to Dawn, we said was going to be next, right? Um, uh, I just want to um, remind everyone, it was on the slides uh, at the beginning, but um, uh, some people may have come on late. Um, we, this is going to be uh, very much a conversation. We will, um, <clears throat> after uh, uh, Dawn and, and Ben introduce their work, then, um, then uh, the three of them and with me tossing in a little bit, we'll have a conversation and then uh, we'll open it up to the rest of you. And with that, uh, let me turn it over to Dawn. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Dawn, and um, I'm so happy to have Lexar uh, hosting uh, Ben and Ronnie and I. Um, and just to have a party with this many people right now is really so wonderful because I think that we've all been feeling so isolated in our own ways. Um, so I, uh, I want to introduce a bit about my artwork. And so let me share the screen. This body of work has spanned the past 11 years and it's evolved along the way. Um, it all started uh, back in from 2003 to 2006. I lived in Takayama City in Gifu Prefecture in Japan. And I was a teacher for the uh, JET program. That's the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program. So um, I was one of the American representatives and sent to the Japanese countryside uh, to be an assistant English teacher, but more so um, to promote grassroots internationalization, basically to promote goodwill between America and Japan. And it's basically a cultural exchange. And so I lived in the town. Um, I taught in a school and I became a part of the community. And so while I was in Japan, I studied kimono wearing and uh, I was in the, um, the Hayakitsuke Taikai, which is the speed wearing competition for my region. Um, and uh, so I learned to wear the many different parts of, uh, at the time, unmarried woman's kimono, um, basically as fast as I could on stage and as accurately as possible. <laughs> and so I love kimonos, I love the designs, and I love uh, just the whole process that goes into it and the art behind it. And so um, also I love pop culture. And so whenever I could about once a month or so, I would hop on the bus and I would go to Tokyo and I would enjoy uh, the, the youth culture in Harajuku and the vibrancy that was going on there. And I was really inspired by the fact that um, alternative and experimental fashion and handmade fashion could be seen just going down the street um, being worn by people, enjoying the park, enjoying the day with their friends, enjoying shopping. And uh, it felt very different to what I would see in the US, which was like, well, it was in a nightclub or it was in a magazine or on a runway and didn't really have a place in everyday life. Um, and so being an artist, I wanted, to, when I returned to the US, I wanted to fuse my experience with traditional Japanese culture and with pop culture um, and also my, bring my own aesthetic to it, which, which is colorful and bright and poppy. And so this, uh, this is actually, this was the first piece that I created along with Ben and with Ronnie, <laughs> who maybe they don't remember, but- Oh, were, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> they were imperative in cutting out many different flower appliques at this point. So I had just started to work with this material um, and all of my pieces are made out of latex, uh, sheet latex rubber. And I love it as a material because as opposed to using a traditional fabric, it's very clean, uh, very finished, and gives this graphic edge that um, looks like a graphic design that's popped out of a page and come to come to real life. And I had a lot of influence from the artist Takashi Murakami, who is famous for the super flat movement in Japan and who's very popular in the US as well. And uh, when Ben and I were living in Brooklyn, uh, when we first met, there was a big uh, Murakami exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. Basically, it was rooms and rooms and rooms and you could just immerse yourself in it. So. Uh, I think that was sort of like the pivotal moment. <laughs> and so I wanted to create these kimonos, um, fusing the old and the new, and my experience. So here are a few. 
I wanted to make them so that they were wearable for people that didn't necessarily have any experience putting on a kimono, which of course is many different layers, undergarments and uh, certain ways of tying. Um, and so it's basically, it's a garment with an OB belt. And so it can be worn, I, I, you know, obviously these aren't everyday wear, they're wearable art or they're for special occasion or for photo shoots. And so I've modified the patterns so that um, actually this one is a zip up the back so that it, there's basically zero uh, crisscrossing. What, what, an interesting thing that I notice is that um, to correctly wear a kimono, you wear the left side over the right side. Um, uh, if you wear right over left, it's kind of a faux pas. That's uh, it's part, part of the funerary practices in Japan. But I think maybe because of the way that we read left to right in English, people see when when i leave the the kimono wearing just to the model and photographer and stylist it always goes right over left and i'll get the photos back and i'll say oh shoot i need to flip it so <laughs> it's just it's this funny quirky thing but uh we just had a um we just had a fashion show for the kimonos we've had several shows for them over the years and i kind of keep them in my costume archive we just had a show over at japan fest in atlanta and uh that was uh, the Japanese Consul General, and it was very supported. So we're very thank I'm very thankful for that. Um, and just you know, I over the years I've sort of picked up and put down the kimonos as a body of work, but I, I like coming back to it now and again because I just love the art form so much. So then that brings us to something that came out of the um, the flowing arms of the kimono and. Uh, sort of bringing forth the, the fantasy aspect of things. And I really like to explore beauty, the female form, fantasy, and also incorporating this new technology, which at the time was pretty new technology, um, and it's laser cutting. So uh, Ben and I will work together to create designs. Um, uh, ben will create vectors uh, using a laser cutter, uh, sorry, using, uh, the, using the program Illustrator and then we will export them to a CNC laser cutter. And then through using an applique process, we'll create the garment panels with the precision so that you can get these details where in the past, when I was doing the kimono designs, it was hand cut everything. And this brings it up to a level that I couldn't get to by hand cutting. So that's some of the, the pieces from this body of work with the butterflies. Here's some more of the laser cutting. So um, as we became more comfortable with uh, using the, the laser cutting as a technique, um, we began to explore larger and larger garment panels. And so uh, by using a laser bed, it basically filling the entire laser bed with the, with the vectors, we could create entire garment panels. And by layering them, the entire garment panel, we could create this full body uh, laser cut design. And I really like um, posing models with um, sculptural works of other artists like this. Is, these are Chihuly pieces that are in Seattle. Uh, ben and I recently moved to Georgia from Seattle. So we basically have the opportunity to, to have lots of different <laughs> influences and backgrounds. This is in the courthouse in Tacoma, uh, Tacoma, Washington. And there's a, there's a museum of glass. So basically the courthouse um, and the museum of glass have a, have a sky bridge with Tahuli pieces all along it. And that's a, that's a fountain um, in Seattle center. That's, it's actually a, a giant speaker. So it plays music and it has waterworks that go along to the music. So here's a little bit of the process. <laughs> so um, I'm setting up the file, basically. There's the, the CNC laser. And uh, once everything's cut, so um, to cut out patterns, basically it used to take me all day just to cut one thing. 
and now in a couple hours you can have an entire garment cut so that's very that's very time saving also um for pricing when you're thinking of pricing your artwork definitely when something takes a fraction of the amount of time that's definitely <laughs> makes things more accessible so it's also easier to get the ideas out when they can, when you, know, you can bring things to fruition so much so much more effectively uh, so once the pieces are cut, they, there's still quite a lot of work that needs to be done. So I have to take the off cuts out individually uh, with a tweezer and then I have to clean the laser residue. Basically the laser is melting uh, the cuts into the rubber material. And once that's, once the off cuts are out, um, the piece is separated from the contact paper that it's on. Uh, and I use a rubber cement thinner to clean off any of the extra residue. Um, from, there's an applique process, basically I have to clean off any of the excess glue from that process as well. And anything that's attached to the garment has to be rubberized. Once it's rubberized, it creates a chemical bond so that it's basically one piece. So I rubberize the fabric zipper and then it can be bonded into the back of the garment. Uh, finishing up the garment, and this is the finished piece. So I work a lot with my photographer friend, Paul Allen, uh, who is in Maryland. And basically, when there's a uh, photo shoot or a garment um, idea, then we'll work together, select the model, and create the look and get beautiful photos out of it. So here's some of the celebrity work. Um, this is Katy Perry for CoverGirl, and the the skirt was a bit of it was an interesting bit of engineering we had to do. So the concept was volumizing mascara. Um, Katy Perry basically pumps up her dress, uh, so it go, it's basically I didn't include the image, but it's a it be, it's a long flowing gown that pumps up and becomes a big puffy gown. So the concept is like puffing up your eyelashes with mascara, <laughs> and um, Let's see. So this is Sharon Stone. Um, and you can see sometimes just something. Uh, so in this case, it was just the gloves. Uh, there's other there's other pieces that were used in this article where it's pants and some other bra and some other pieces. But for the high fashion magazines, generally basics are what the magazines want as something to offset um, the the fabric garment. Um, it's like adding a little bit of edginess to the to the photo shoot. This is um, Beyonce at the 2014 MTV uh, Video Music Awards um, and the ensemble dancers. And so when it's uh, when whenever we're working with the music industry, it's a very high turnover um, in terms of the deadline. So we'll get a call like the night before saying we need 70 things by tomorrow morning. We're going to send a courier and you have to figure out if you want the job you have to figure out how you can how you can make it work so at this time we had it scaled up at the time so it was basically like a family assembly line making making everything and um getting it out and getting it overnighted to la and uh some you know it, it does it you panic a little you take a breath you figure out the math and then you can get it done <laughs> And it's very satisfying when you see everything on TV and Twitter and Facebook and everything. Uh, this is Kylie Jenner for um, Interview Magazine. And uh, so, well, we all know about the Kardashians. So anyway, this is, uh, it, this is, my, this is my experience with dressing a Kardashian <laughs> in this case. And this was this was pretty cool because they um, they didn't tell me who we'd be dressing. They basically said, "Here's the measurements, and um, this is the budget." And so I found out because I woke up one morning and I went on Twitter, and it was like, "Donna Matrix, congratulations!" And and uh, so it was um, it was through that kind of thing that I said, "Oh wow, we actually dress Kylie Jenner." And there's like five or six outfits that we did for that editorial. So now we go on to world of wearable art competition. So uh, I'm sure that many of you in, the Ma in Massachusetts learned about world of wearable art when they did an exhibition at the Peabody Essex Museum. And uh, Ben and I, when we were living in Seattle, uh, actually we saw 
the World of Wearable Art exhibition just before Boston got it. Um, and it was at the Museum of Pop Culture. And we went in and we said, what is this? We've never, we never knew about this before. Why didn't we know about this? It's been around for 25 years. How can we be a part of it? We need to be a part of it. So we got all the information and uh, we found out there's six categories every year. Three of them are rotating. Three of them stay the same. And um, it's a Cirque du Soleil style show. It's actually sponsored by Cirque du Soleil. And basically you create your garments. They're sent via sponsored freighting to New Zealand. And um, if they get past the pre-selection and the selection process, then they're on stage as finalists. And then there's a chance to win really awesome prizes and um, a chance to meet artists, uh, wearable art artists from all over the world. Um, and every year there's something like 30 or 40 countries or maybe more, uh, in, depend, it changes depending on the year. And so we, Ben and I uh, entered this piece and I, um, so this is the labyrinth gown and we entered it into the Aotearoa section, which is the, um, the New Zealand, that's the Maori name for New Zealand. So it's the indigenous uh, culture and people of New Zealand and how we interpret that. So this was using the applique process that I've introduced to you and uh, using these symbols um, that cover the body and the pose that the model is in with the, her eyes popped open and the, the rigid pose of her arms, a very traditional Maori pose, um, but wearing this very modern garment. And this won the uh, Wearable Technology First Place Award. And this is a piece that I created uh, with my friend Lana Crooks, who is a fabric sculptor, and she's located in Portland, Oregon. And we collaborated on this piece um, where I created the base garments and she created these uh, laser cut wings. There's feathers on the hem of the dress. And then on the shoulder, you can see these sculpted raven skulls that are also beaded. This piece is called the messenger because the, the raven is the messenger to the afterlife. And so this piece was in the red category and this place third in the red category. So Ben and I had flown down to New Zealand for this show in uh, 2017. And I mean, our minds were blown. Like they had so much, so many activities set up for us, um, introductions. They had a Maori blessing for us. They, we were guests of, you know, we were guests of the New Zealand uh, government and cultural council. And the, we were introduced to the different uh, dignitaries and businesses and just got to explore and enjoy New Zealand. And it was really wonderful. So this has been in my entry from uh, 2018. So the category was under the microscope and these are blood cells and it's a red blood cell, a white blood cell and a nano cell. And so, uh, you know, we're certain of the red blood cell and the white blood cells function, but with this new technology of the nano cell, um, with putting nanotechnology within, within human bloodstream, is it to help us or is it to harm us? And we wanted to have that kind of ambiguity in a wearable sculpture. And so I have a video here that is, it was actually, they used the pieces in a promo for World of Wearable Art, so I'll play that for you now. So that was a that was a nice surprise when we found out that they had used our piece for that. Oh, let me not play it again. <laughs> so this was another piece uh, from 2018 that I had collaborated with my friend Snow Winters on, and she is a jewelry designer. So um, again, I created the base garments, dress, corset, hood, and this um, this headpiece made out of plastic film. And Snow created these acrylic uh, armor pieces. And so 
I can show you the video of that one in motion. And in, in this video, you can really see the production value that's at World of Wearable Art. So this one, yes, this one was in reflective surfaces section and placed third. And I forgot to mention that um, the uh, for foreign bodies, Ben in my piece with the blood cells that won won the overall international award, and also the uh, the award for the Americas as well. Okay, so then this one is from last year. This is the last thing that I'll show you. Uh, so this is Gemini the twins, and we created this for the avant garde category. And this is sort of the culmination of all of our laser cut prowess <laughs> and applying it to a garment. Um, we wanted to create these two opposing uh, and collaborative forces that uh, basically work together to seduce and confuse. And uh, again, we wanted that, that sort of ambiguity uh, as a concept, so just like with foreign bodies where it was like, do they help or do they harm? It was sort of like, they're, they're, they're otherworldly, they're creatures, they're human, but they're not, they're definitely, uh, you know, they have an alien quality about them, but they have these human mouths. And so, uh, you know, what is, what is their goal? What are they up to? And so I can show you a close up of them. So you can see um, the, the eyes are punched so that from a distance, and when you're at the World of Wearable Art Show, you have, uh, I, I believe, three to 5,000 people and maybe about 3,000 people in the audience. It's 60,000 over the course of two and a half weeks. So you have to create things that are from a, from a distance and from up close. We wanted to create this sort of smooth face and sort of the illusion that, that there's an unbroken design across their face. And here's the video for this one. And so we were we were shocked to find out that we won the oops, sorry that we won the uh, the overall international award for the second year in a row with uh, with that uh, entry and we had just been preparing to submit the entry for this year um, literally we had just photographed it and we're submitting the entry when we got the notification that the 2020 competition was postponed until 2021 um, and so. Uh, you know, hopefully if things are better next year, we, we hope to go to New Zealand for, for the competition next year. We, we definitely have our entry going in. We have to keep it under wraps, but we'll share it all with you when, uh, when we can. And I think that's all for now for me. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dawn. Ben, take it away. Um, I've been smiling for half an hour now. Uh, my jaw is already tired, but I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> um, so I've got uh, a great variety of things to share here. Um, as, as Wayne mentioned in the beginning, and thank you again for, for uh, inviting us to share our work with everybody. This is really a great honor. And it, as mom pointed out, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's really quite cool to see everybody's names and faces. Um, lots of folks back home in Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, so big hello to everybody. Um, so I went to school uh, where, where Dawn and I met actually uh, in Brooklyn at Pratt Institute and my focus was industrial design specifically towards toy design. Um, designing toys just seemed like such a noble um, reason to create products, um, not only to amuse children, but also hopefully to teach them something. Um, and so some of the, some of the items I'm going to show tonight are, are products, um, and also a lot of other 
things that I've gotten myself into. And I, I've kind of had this conflict in my own career between the arts and uh, commercial art and, and sort of always exploring new things and learning about new things myself. Um, so I can kind of be more and more well-rounded with a, a bigger toolbox. Um, so Smart Circuits, this is a project that I did um, with Smart Lab, which is part of the Quarto Publishing Group on the West Coast in Seattle. Um, I'm still so proud of the work that I did with this team. Um, it was, uh, they're so dedicated to telling the story behind every product that they release and really doing um, excellent research to make sure that the content is always there to support the science of each toy that they sell. Um, so Smart Circuits was obviously all about electronics. And so we, we devised an electronics learning kit. Um, and I had the pleasure of designing the physical modules and designing the grid that you can see in blue on the cover image there. Um, so physically how all of these parts fit together and then working with um, the, uh, the founder and CEO, Jim Becker, who's a genius with electronics, who had devised a lot of the different um, electronic games that could be played with these basic modules. Um, so we, we designed the kit with a microprocessor, which is the thing that you see in green there. And we came up with 50 different projects that could all be unlocked um, just by wiring things around differently and, and arranging them differently on the page uh, or on the grid rather. And uh, something I'm also extremely proud of is I know when I was much younger and was starting to explore different things, I was such a visual learner. Um, and, uh, and so I, it, it was a priority for me for that reason to make sure that kids of even the youngest age could look at the images that we released in the 50 page book that accompanied this kit. Um, and just from the images alone, not only know how to put it all together, but also learn a lot of the integral science that's happening within there. Um, so the image on the lower right hand side, the varying light levels explains how a variable resistor works. And you can see the little uh, elect electrons running around the wires to, to help tell that story. And then the wiring system is actually shown on the left-hand side. You can see the different modules and each individual wire connection is illustrated. Um, so this, again, I'm so proud of, of this item and, and um, it's been extremely well received. And, and one of the pleasures of working in toys is, is that once the product is out there and it's beyond my control, I can still sit back and, and look on Amazon and check out people's reviews and kind of see well, how is it doing and, and where are people going with this. And, and it's, a, it's a great pleasure for me even still every, every few months I, I check back on these things and, and see how they're, how they're faring out there in the world. Um, this is a totally different product, but one that is certainly driven by fun. Um, I was focused on backyard gaming while I was working with Toysmith in Sumner, Washington. And I became really interested in this rising trend of ax throwing. Um, at the time, there were a lot of different bars, mostly you know adult bars, as you would guess, um, where people can go and have a drink and throw axes at big wooden targets. Um, and I thought, well, that's really neat, but really dangerous. And I wondered if there was a way that I could make this accessible for younger kids or even adults who really don't want to be messing around with sharpened blades to enjoy the fun at home. And so I came up with this foam axe. It's all uh, three, three part compression molded EVA foam with a strip of Velcro that runs around the axe head. Um, and what's really tricky about this is, is you still have to throw the axe as you would a real axe if you've ever had the occasion to throw a tomahawk. Um, it's all in the spin. Um, so it really made for a fun game and a fun challenge, um, but now you can play it in your office. And I, I indeed have one set up in my, in my office here. Um, it won the uh, Top Toy of the Year Award for the Creative Child Awards um, 
in 2019. So that was a great thrill. And, and it seems to be doing really, really well uh, on Amazon as well. It's great to see people posting videos of them throwing axes in the backyard. Um, Swill Snaps is another product I had the pleasure of, uh, of helping to develop. On the left-hand side are the original three parts that were developed um, before I, I joined uh, with the cr Creative Toys team. Um, they took these three parts and it was incredible the range of things that they were able to create. So the, the white post pictured on the left-hand side is able to snap in to the blue square or to the red triangle. And you can see the kind of negative cutouts. Um, but what makes this toy really different from any other uh, construction toy on the market is that you can snap six different um, components onto the same post, or you can have a single panel snapped onto a post and it can rotate around 360 degrees around that post. So it creates all of these interesting movements that you can make and also opens it up to all different kinds of angular shapes um, and complex forms. So from that basic system, um, I was charged with, well, how, you know, where do we go from here? And wheels were the first thing that we knew we absolutely had to do, um, give people the option to create these all, you know, all kinds of uh, wild vehicles, you know, as soon as you get wheels involved, it, it changes the game. And then of course we had to have a character. And so the, the character pictured on the right hand side is called our swivel sprite. Um, and these guys just kind of create a scale um, that makes playing with the toy that much more engaging because now you've, you've, you've established every, you know, the size of the world that you're imagining that you're playing within. Um, so here you can see some of these different components actually in use together. Um, all of these images, by the way, are all renderings. Um, so these are all, you know, none of this is actual physical product. Um, even that car image that's on the right hand side, these are all digitally rendered. Um, part of my basic skill set going back to my time at school was learning how to work within CAD and specifically SolidWorks. Um, to generate all different kinds of geometry for manufacturing, but also for product concept. Um, and in this case, I'm, I'm also using these kinds of renderings to do packaging and even build instructions. So even though the image on the, on the top here, the instructions look like a, a 2D drawing, um, they're actually indeed a 3D object that can be you know, turned within my program and then kind of printed out to a, a 2D rendering. Um, so I get to play with some really fun programs in, in, my, in my coursework. Um, and here you can see how these renderings are actually being used on the front of packages. Um, and again, that, that image of the, uh, the single one swivel sprite package is, is again, just a, a concept rendering of of a package. Um, so again, these are just really powerful tools and, and really a joy to work with. And I'm, I'm very excited to see where Swivel Snaps goes. It's still fairly new to the market, so we'll see. Um, so as I was developing my, my work in CAD, um, a common problem for a lot of people that study engineering is that CAD is not so great at organic modeling. So you can't do um, complex curvature or making things look really anatomic. Um, so I, I began to learn uh, about a year and a half ago, a new program called ZBrush um, that allows me to sculpt. Um, and I actually, I introduced my mom to this program at one point and, and showed her how fun it is. And it was, it was really cool that we, we kind of leveled creatively um, with this new tool. Um, because it behaves like clay, you know, if it's doing its job, it should behave just like clay, which is sort of the ultimate um, sculpting tool. So I, I learned this program while I was working with good to grow I was helping them to develop a bunch of collectible characters. And you can see along the top here is John Cena, the um, WWE pro wrestler. 
Um, and I found just reference images of him on the internet and then created my sculpt, uh, which you can see turned along the middle. And then for everybody in New England, if you don't know who's along the bottom, I question if you're really in New England. That's, that's Tom Brady. <laughs> so while I was getting into sculpting, um, I felt I really needed to return to my roots um, and go back to what I was learning back in like my first year of art school um, and, and reconnect doing figure drawing. So I found a, uh, a weekly meetup in Atlanta, the Atlanta Artists Association. Um, and they, they had a, oh, sorry, Atlanta Artists Center, excuse me. Um, it's actually very much like Lex Art, but being down here in Atlanta, I needed to find somewhere else I could go. Um, and they had these uh, weekly sessions with a live model. And I actually, these are not painted. These again are digital. Um, I brought my, uh, my Wacom tablet with me, which is a uh, all-in-one computer that has a drawing screen on the front. And it's been an invaluable tool for me to do concept renderings, to, to be able to bring my hand in, um, at, you know, in the course of my work. Sometimes it's just, there's no, uh, there's no substitute for hand drawing. Um, you know, especially if you have to get a lot of ideas out rapidly, or if you're looking for, you know, that really human element, you've got to just, you know, get the hand and hand work into it. Um, so at the time I was, I was again, doing a lot of anatomic sculpting and I thought it'd be great to reconnect with figure drawing. Um, and uh, at the same time, I had just acquired this tablet and I kind of wanted to put it through its paces and also force myself to work quickly. Um, so each of these paintings, you know, digital paintings, are you know, from you know, two minutes to 20 minutes tops. Um, these are all just done as rapidly as possible and it, it was really great fun. Um, a couple of these, these are a little bit longer studies. I think these might've been like 30 minutes or half an hour, or uh, 45 minutes, excuse me. Um, but uh, again, great fun. And this is a body of work that I, I would like to continue to explore, um, especially using digital tools in a live setting, I think is an interesting combination. Um, and the, the technology, I think, is just beginning to get good enough that you can mimic paint um, really effectively. And uh, it's, been, it's been a joy for me. Um, so, okay, bit of a left turn. Um, I hope I didn't lose anybody, but this is another uh, set of, another body of work I just really wanted to include, um, but it is related. So, so this is a, a furniture design project that I did. Um, and again, at the time, this was all hand drawing. Um, all of the concept drawings you see in the center, these are all just pencil art. Um, and there was really no substitute. I was actually doing this design contract um, living in Massachusetts at the time, but working with a team that was based in Michigan. And I would send them these rapid concept sketches. I think at one point I even took a photo of my sketchbook and, and I was on an airplane at the time and I was able to send them a photo over Wi-Fi of a pencil sketch. Um, so just a great way to be, you know, rapidly communicating. And then um, the, the chairs and the entire furniture set went into production. And I just so happened to see them out in the wild, totally by happenstance uh, in Fort Lauderdale at the, um, the Red Stripe Bar that's in uh, one of the terminals. And I, I think I dropped my beer. No, I didn't drop my beer, but I was, I was flabbergasted to see them in person. It was such a, such a wonderful surprise. Um, so these concepts, this page and the next page, this is all um, some of my most recent work. Um, I'm working now with IG Design Group, which is part of International Greetings, the British-based um, product company. And we produce an enormous range of products. Um, so there's a constant need to be able to render up product concepts quickly and very realistically. Um, 
So with the tools at my disposal using a combination of CAD and KeyShot, which is the rendering program that I'm using currently, I'm able to shave off about six months of development time that it would take to get these designs over to a factory overseas, get them to make us a sample, get that sample to be correct, and then get that sample shipped over here and then in front of a photographer. Um, so in an afternoon, I can, I can just circumvent that whole process and, and create these photorealistic renderings. Um, and here's another set. These are, these are just some of my favorites from the last uh, couple of months. Some of my favorite items that we've worked on together. And then what's, what's also wonderful is um, we can scale this, you know, so scale is kind of um, a moot point when it comes to digital rendering. It doesn't really matter how big or small something is. Um, so in this case, I'm, I'm able to render up an entire display filled with product to show what it would look like when it's actually being presented at retail at the store level. Um, so another left turn. <laughs> um, this is a project that I, I worked on. Uh, I actually started a, a company um, called Ziva, um, which is Zero Emissions Vertical Aircraft. Um, we formed a company in Tacoma, Washington, along with uh, electronic engineers, electrical engineers, aerodynamicists, um, and I was at the time the chief designer on the staff. Um, and working with the team, we were entering a competition. There's a design competition called GoFly uh, that was sponsored by Boeing to try and get independent design teams to come up with uh, a single person electric vehicle that can do a vertical takeoff and landing um, and then maintain, I think it was about uh, half an hour of continuous flight in the air. So it's really all about energy. Um, so this was a great learning experience for me, getting, getting a chance to um, you know, be exposed to a lot of different sciences and, and scientists in the course of things um, and try and synthesize is all of the ideas that were on the table towards this really uh, high goal, um, which is flight. I mean, there's, there's nothing greater than that. Um, and we, we were actually able to create a, a physical model, a physical prototype. Um, I think that they've begun, just begun flight testing. You can see my partner, Steve Tibbetts there. Um, this is out at an airfield. They're, they're showing it off at the GoFly competition. And uh, it's, again, really a thrill to see where they go. And, and it's something I'm, I'm excited to see as it continues to develop. And then completely on the flip side, we're talking low technology, but this is something that I'm passionate about. And it's something that I think uh, really speaks to my more artistic side. Um, but again, it's for the, the sheer joy and utility of it. I, I love building barbecue smokers. Um, and I built my first one. Um, that was back in 2014, I believe, um, which is the one pictured on the left there. Um, at the time, we had, we had moved away from a lot of our friends who were closer into Boston, and we were suddenly 45 minutes away from everybody. And so I, I needed to give everybody a really good excuse to come out and visit us. And so I built this extravagant barbecue and, and learned how to use it. And that's been kind of the, the key ever since. Everywhere we've, <laughs> everywhere we've moved, I've had to build a new one and we've moved a few times. Um, so the, the first one was in Boston. The second one was uh, in North Carolina. Uh, the third I built out west in Seattle. And this is for the, for the first time ever. Uh, this is a work in progress, um, building my fourth one right now. Um, which is <laughs> for the first time I'm going, going figurative in, in your honor, mom, um, <laughs> doing something figurative in steel. And, uh, Dawn, Dawn gave me the challenge actually. So this is, this is more, more her fault. <laughs> she asked me to make a dragon. Um, so I haven't gotten the wings on it yet. I haven't done the grills yet or the eyes, but uh, a functional piece of art, um, that's sure to bring people together when we're, when we're all able to be back together. 
but thank you very much. It, it was really fun for me to go through all those things. And again, I'm, I'm still smiling from your presentations. Thank you very much, um, Ben. And uh, we had a couple of, of questions for, um, for Dawn with, in the chat. And I believe actually you, um, you answered uh, some of those. Uh, but let me, um, and there was one, one question for Ronnie, but before we get to that, I'd just like to ask the, the three of you. So uh, I know you spend a lot of time talking with each other, debating, prodding, and, and so forth. What is it that you see is the common thread in across all the work that all three of you do? Or is, there, or is there not a common thread? I mean, I would say more so than like topical, it's more like it's that, it, like Ben said, it's, the, um, it's that determination and that dedication to the craft. I mean, we're not the kind of people that try something and then say, oh, it's not working and then give up. Like we're, we're very driven. Yeah. Uh, when we have a concept or a challenge or a project, we'll, see it through to the end. And if, if we get stuck, we ask each other for help. Yeah. yeah. There's also, there's also always been a level of respect. And um, I so completely admire the work that they do. And so to be able to find myself in a, and, and we do often a discussion about, for instance, what, you know, I may get stuck in terms of trying to work out a concept and just throwing it out there, there's a tremendous amount of, like I said, respect and trust in terms of um, the, the, the feedback that I'm, that I'm going to get, get back from them. Um, we take each other's questions seriously. Um, we really try to help each other out, really think deeply about um, where it is where we're going. Sometimes I'll find myself in a box with it it's almost like a maze through the thinking process to get where I want to go. And being able to talk to these two have always been, uh, it's always been tremendously helpful. I mean, from the time that Ben has been quite young, um, it has been tremendously helpful. We've always had these discussions. So it's great. It's great. I feel very lucky. <laughs> that actually is, is one of the questions I had kind of written down for you, mom. We, we <laughs> talked about write, writing down questions for each other that we wanted to ask. I, I was curious to know um, if you can remember when, when did I become helpful for you? Because you were certainly a, a huge help and influence in my uh, developing as an artist and, and ever since. Um, and I'm just curious, like, was there, was there a, a particular piece or conversation that we had when I was younger where I was like, all of a sudden I'm, I'm engaging on a, on a more adult level? <laughs> <laughs> well, you were always engaging. <laughs> you know, um, I, I, I think, I, I don't remember one specific um, time, but what I do remember is the way you would approach materials from the time you were quite young. You fascinated yourself with scissors and paper for, from the time you were really young, cutting like these very intricate uh, patterns out of paper. And a um, lot of, I have to give you credit because a lot of parents would worry about yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, seeing that, it, it, you know, it, it, I was fascinated to see what you were doing and, and where you were going with things. So, you know, I certainly always encouraged um, um, that kind of thing. And um, I think by the time, you know, you hit, hit middle school, you were already, you chose to start taking classes um, at the uh, Institute of Art in Boston. Um, you got yourself up every Saturday morning, out the door early, you know, and, um, and you did that right through high school. And um, you would come home then and talk to me about, about things. So perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps it was around middle school where we really had these engaging conversations about art and creativity because well, you were I'm, already deep into it by then. I'm sure being exposed to other artists was a big part of it. Um, 
being able to talk to other artists is a big part of being an artist, being able to express yourself um, and, and also work through your own decisions in the course of making your own art. You have to have your own internal dialogue. Um, so I think talking to each other all through my childhood about art really prepared me to have that, that internal dialogue of my own. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> my greatest joy. <laughs> so so uh, let me first ask Ronnie. Um, so think back to your childhood and are, are there things you can remember from your childhood that are coming back to you today as you make art? Um, pro yeah, the, there was, um, I'm, I always loved building things. I always loved nature. Um, I loved my dogs. Um, I was an observer from the time I was young. I would remember spaces that I had always been in. Um, uh, for instance, you know, I could, I could draw the, you know, the, the layout of any, any house I've ever been in that those kind of things stay with me, um, in terms of just being very visual and kind of absorbing the world. But I also remember in kindergarten when it, we, it was for mother's day and they had this plaster form and you stuck your hand in it for your impression. And I remember putting my hand into that plaster and I was like, let me play with this stuff. But, a, but the teacher just pulled my hand out and said, okay, that's enough. Next, go wash your hand. And I was like, give me more of that stuff. And I remember the feeling of it. Um, and I remember having my hands in clay again when I was, I think I might have been in sixth grade. And a neighbor was a, um, was a ceramic artist. And I went over with my parents and I started... Um, you know, they didn't want me as part of the conversation. I went down into a studio and I was playing with clay and I was just starting, I was modeling figures and things like that. It just felt right for me. And um, so those feelings have always, always stuck with me. And I think at some point as an adult, I gave myself permission to just do what made me really happy, which was really, it was working with the clay. Well, that, that's incredible. Uh to think that uh, being denied something at five years old and then it just obsessed you for life. <laughs> That's right. I'll show you. I'm playing with this stuff. But, but I, I, I hear in what you say uh, something that, um, uh, as I've been talking with the members of, of LexArt um, about what, what inspires them, wh where, where do things come from, I actually hear so, uh, uh, a common theme um, which is often that there's something in the early childhood years, three, four, five, six, seven, and then the accelerant seems to come somewhere in the middle school or early teenage years with some exposure to some sort of mentor. Sometimes it's a parent, oftentimes it's someone else who's demonstrating a level of expertise and mastery uh, that seems to um, help accelerate the push in, into something. So I'm wondering, I, now I want to turn to Dawn. We heard from you about inspiration that you got from Japan, but let's continue the theme and ask you to go further back into your life. And, and uh, so what, what were the things that happened early in your life that made it such that when you actually got to Japan, that was the big aha, this is what I've been looking for. Well, it's funny because I'm looking at the grid of all the people on the screen and I see my mom looking at me and waving right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, have to, I have to give her the credit for uh, always being really, really enthusiastic about Halloween and about Purim every year. And so we were, <laughs> that's two chances to dress up in costumes. <laughs> and um, so we were in, in our house, we were always really, really big on making our own costumes and going all out and winning the costume contests. And um, how many paper mache heads we made of, of uh, Garfield and rabbits and bears and like whatever thing, we were blowing up the balloons and doing paper mache and then painting and, and creating a, the character um, and gathering 
items from recycle shops and and you know get and craft shops and creating creating something so i think like the earliest costume i can remember was from pre-k or kindergarten where i was a cat a cat from the broadway play cats and uh and so i was i was like a cool black cat <laughs> and um so throughout throughout all the throughout the, my childhood i just have like this um just happy memories of creating outfits gluing feathers and rainbow colors and green mohawks to be a parrot and just any kind of thing to create a transformation. Um, and so thank you, mommy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I held on to that throughout the years and it was like, you know, I have this memory of being like 15 or 16 with my friend group. And of course we're all artists. And actually I see Alexandra is in the group. She's one of my oldest friends, um, from ninth grade on. And, uh, we were in art class in high school and you know we would paint ourselves with acrylic paint and i don't know just it's like we were the canvas and we we were saying one year we were about 15 or 16 and we said you know we we don't feel ready to give up trick-or-treating yet we, we, <laughs> don't, we don't feel like we want to dress up and go around trick-or-treating even if we're going to be the oldest kids and then we talked to all of our friend group and it was like 15 it was like a dozen or 15 people and we were like everyone was like yeah we we don't feel we don't feel like we're too old for trick-or-treating and so it was just like it was an excuse for everybody to make their costumes and everybody to dress up and roam around a neighborhood and and so um I don't know I mean that's definitely got to be part of it but I was always in that sort of you know the art kids group and then I went to Ringling College of Art for my undergrad um, in computer animation, which was like totally rigid and not costume based at all because they didn't have a fashion department. But I just did that as an independent study so I could still continue the fashion, um, uh, you know, on until comic conventions and clubbing became a thing. And then I could travel around the country and go to the comic conventions. And then pretty soon after I, I got into the, the Japan program. So it just it was all like a means to an end to explore costuming and, and you know, transformation through mm -hmm. costuming. Great. Um, we had a question from much earlier uh, for Ronnie. Um, what's the scale of your work? Um, those different images you showed us, were those all, all similarly scaled or? Well, I'm, I'm limited with the size of my kiln, <laughs> but there are times in which I will stack a piece or cut a piece um and then um build on um my kiln is 18 inches high um the majority of my pieces are mo you know 18 uh, around 12 inches to 18 piece uh, 18 inches and there'll be others that are much taller if i have stacked it if i have built it up um i don't go too big and certainly going forward in my life, it's, you know, I'm not as strong as I was. <laughs> and pulling these pieces out of a, out of a very hot kiln, um, they get heavy. And, and they, I think they're getting heavier. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've sort of decided that I need to limit the size of the pieces. Okay, well, that's good. Well, um, Janice uh, Wisniewski, I, um, Hi, Janice. Janice had a question for you. So uh, Janice, why don't you uh, pitch it? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not looking at exactly what I typed, but I was wondering when you make your animal pieces, do you envision them exactly all in one uh, as you want them to turn out and then execute your vision or do they in evolve? Is there a lot of spontaneity as you're working and happy accidents? And do they turn out um, different than when you started as a vision? Or do you do you envision them and they turn out? Um, do you execute a vision that you had a, a whole cloth kind of? Yeah, I hear I, I, um, I will have a feeling about a particular animal or say I want to, you know, um, make the snow leopard. Um, if I'm not sure about what a snow leopard looks like, I will, you know, I love Google images and I will look at a lot of images of snow leopards and um, decide on, on how I want it to be. But I feel that there, and I've said this, 
said this in the past, and I think it's true that that the material itself has its own personality. So um, when I'm putting an animal together, I, I work in in large slabs, and I want those slabs to, um, you know, uh, lean in one direction a little bit or, or another way. Or it, it's kind of I've, I let the clay speak. And it's almost like a conversation between myself and the clay um, so that I don't control um, every single movement um, it, it, in the pose. I want some, um, I, I want the clay to be able to speak to, to a degree too. Mm -hmm. um, this way for me, it feels fresher. I feel like if I work a piece too much or try to control it too much, I kind of lose it. It can, can become very stagnant. So I like, I like, I like letting the clay do some of some of the work. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, if other folks have questions that they'd like to pose, just um, uh, pop into the chat and let me know that you had a uh, a question. Um, I, I want to toss something to uh, Ben and Dawn that I've, I've been uh, aching to ask you ever since we we came up with the concept uh, for this. Um, so how do you provoke each other in your art? Hmm. How do you poke, prod, um, <laughs> deliberately, um, the, you know, the grit of sand um, in, the, uh, in the oyster to produce the pearl for the other one? I go, Ben, I need some vectors. <laughs> I don't know exactly what they are, but I yeah. have a concept. And She'll be like, you've got, you've got this much space to work with it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it has to be full body. I know she's a, she's a queen from another planet. And here's, here's an example of like the kind of aesthetic. And then, and then, you know, Ben will be like, okay, let me, give me, a, give me an hour. And then he'll create like a whole, <laughs> Um, a whole canvas. <laughs> well, it's true. I mean, we, we often just divide and conquer, but I think before that, the, the conversation part where we're, we're, you know, talking often for months at a time, it, this has especially um, been true for our entries with the world of wearable art um, because we continue to collaborate for that competition because it's a great way for both of us to really stretch our skills and, and really try something totally off the wall and, um, and innovative you know, with our materials. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, <laughs> off the wall. <laughs> this is, sorry to jump in. This is um, the Philadelphia Museum of Art has put our uh, foreign bodies piece in their um, exhibition catalog for this American Art to Wear exhibition. So just- yeah. But this past year, I mean, we, so the, the piece that we're working on currently that we were about to enter for, for uh, what would be coming up this month if, uh, if WOW was not um, postponed, we, we had a really hard time. I mean, we, we went back and forth a lot and we went through a lot of sketches and we went through a lot of conversations trying to find what is something that we both want to express it was hard. And I think ultimately what won the day was my wife. <laughs> but, but what ultimately won the day was, was a, an agreement on something that was beautiful. I think, I think when both of us, when we see it and, and we know it's good, that's when we know that's the direction we need to, we need to pursue. Um, and oftentimes we have, to, we have to be willing to just walk blindly down a road without knowing the significance at least a little bit, the first couple of steps, and then realize why we're here. Why are we exploring this? Yeah, why are we? Like we'll we'll know what we'll know the form, but we don't know who this person is yet until until we start putting them putting the pieces together. And we'll we'll have a basic outline of a concept, but but you know the the heart of them is not there yet until we see them in front of us. Yeah. So is it is it a, a a character that kind of grows on you, or is it the form, or both, or how, how does that work? It's I mean, I, where where this question is coming from is, yeah. is um, we've been talking to some writers about character, and you know, does the 
does is the characters that start in their mind when they're writing or the character sort of comes in and inhabits and and grows on them as as writers so i'm curious whether it's something similar to to that goes with the work that you're creating i would say it's an it's an outline of a character it's basically like a one sentence you know it's it's a one sentence black and white <laughs> like a, in terms of speaking like a, you know they're not fleshed out yet mm -hmm. um but as we start working together on it and and then we can see what's the torso what's the head what goes on the arms and the legs how, what's their presence on a stage what's their presence you know from five feet away what's their presence from 200 feet away how are they going to move and express that because um, ultimately we have to give the direction to the choreographer on you know who this person is and, and what kind of world they live in and how they move in their space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I also want to I just, um, character is a design concept as much as it is a literary concept. Um, you can easily fall into the habit of creating the same stroke, the same line quality, the same kind of shapes I think a lot of artists may catch themselves repeating themselves. Um, and these are all expressions of a kind of character. I think really original character design is something that you've really not seen before. And you often have to stretch and distort a design to reach something that's really unique. Um, you know, in the one hand, we're really fortunate to be working in unusual materials because there's a lot of um, undiscovered ground for us. Um, and we've worked on a lot of technologies and, and coming up with new ways of manipulating materials that can uncover these unusual characters in ways other people haven't discovered before. Um, I think that's a large part of why we, Dawn and I both enjoy working in more modern materials and always pushing technologies. So that kind of leads me to a question that I had for Ronnie, um, mm -hmm. which is if you are going to collaborate with us on the next World of Wearable Art entry, how would you, um, how would you incorporate your ceramics or another art form into it? I think this would be an exciting place for us to get together and, and, and talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because right off the top of my head, it's not there, but it would be <laughs> a lot of fun to be able to do that with both of you. Yeah, yeah. love yeah. that I idea. I remember at the um, Peabody Essex, the, the first time I saw the WOW exhibit, which I just happened to walk in and, and it was there. I was there to see something else. And I walked in and I remember calling you or texting you immediately. You wouldn't believe what I'm looking at. You have to yeah. know. <laughs> That's the city you had already just found out about it. Um, but um, I remember seeing one that was done out of ceramics and almost like ceramic tiles. Yeah. And it was extraordinary, almost painted, I think, if I remember it, in the Delft style on each of these tiles. It was, it was quite amazing. So, uh, yeah, and, and, and you're right, Ben. I was listening to what you were saying. It is very easy sometimes to. Um, start with the thread of an idea where it is something that you've seen or something that you have done, but then you have to go from there. You have yeah. to make it your own. You have to make it unique. You have to be able to push the envelope from that point. You know, once you've got this image of somebody, maybe somebody else's work, it's like, uh, no, I can't stop there. I've got to make it mine. I've got to make it new. Yeah, and it's that's just like, it's just work, how... That's when Wayne, the work kicks in. Yeah, that, that's right. And it's just how Wayne put it, that it's the grit in the pearl, <laughs> you know. Um, but but the work, I mean, it's all about not spending time on the couch. You've got to just keep working. Whatever it is that you're trying to pursue, um, you can't be giving up that time to just relax. You've got to... And, and you know, we, we have this incessant bother i'm sure inspiration is uh you know very bothersome sometimes you just got to get back to work on it until you've seen it through um for me that that smoker image that i showed at the end there has been my bother you know, for the last 
last month or so, and I've just been exhausting myself um, after work each day, you know, putting in a couple more hours in the garage. But I love it. And, uh, and for me, you know, the vision that I'm trying to attain is just bringing people together. And that's like, that's what yeah. I need right now. Yeah. Well, loving, loving the work is a, is a huge motivator. And, and what's also true, what you just said is being in it, actually working, um, helps, helps trigger the brain in terms of a lot of those ideas. Like sometimes I'll find myself, um, I just had to get my hands in the clay. I may do a dog that I've done multiple times before. Each one is different, but it's like, I just have to be in the, cl in the clay and being there will help me just by working with the material, trigger some of the other ideas. Yeah, and clay is so responsive, so immediate also. Um, I mean, do, do you ever find it's hard to imagine what it will look like when it's fully finished? Or are you constantly kind of calculating what the, what the firing will do? once it's gone through those processes that are out of your control? Well, the, I, there's always a range in which I know it will be. In terms of the glazes, once you fire the glazes enough times, you become familiar with the glazes. So I know that there's gonna be a range of what it's going to give me. Um, but of course, it, you know, there's always that element of surprise when you take it out of the kiln and then out of the can to, to be able to see that Oh, there, there are some magical things that happen that I couldn't control, but there they are. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I almost wanted to shout out when you were showing the French bull in your presentation with the, the rainbows up in the ears. Yes, I couldn't control that. That yeah, just happened that. on its own. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's just so wonderful to hear, hear you all. Um, just to come back to uh, this question, so where, where does perception, uh, inspiration, creativity come from? And um, uh, what I'm hearing is it's this uh, combination of um, environmental family exposure, uh, accidental things that one stumbles across combined with this persistence, obsession and discipline to work it out and take it where it will go. Um, and uh, I, I think that those are uh, those are common themes um, that we all work with uh, every day. So uh, that was really wonderful. Well, we're, we've come up to about uh, 8.30. And um, uh, as I think we talked about in preparing for this, um, I know the three of you could keep on talking about this for hours. You've spent years doing it and you love doing it. And uh, we certainly have enjoyed having the conversation uh, with you. Um, as we, we close, I'd just like to uh, uh, thank the, the three of you, uh, Ronnie, Ben, and Dawn. Um, your work is wonderful, and we very much appreciate your sharing it with us as long, uh, along with your experiences. And I would just like to um, also thank everyone who, uh, who joined us this evening. I would invite you to join us again, and I will quickly share my screen just so that you can see that we've got um, another program coming up in another month. We're going to do these the third Thursday of every month. And I guess we're on a little bit on a Bedford theme. I hadn't quite realized that. Okay. Uh, but uh, Matthew Siegel and Melinda Lopez, who both uh, are living in, in Bedford. Matthew is at the uh, MFA and Melinda is a well-known playwright uh, here in the Boston area. And, um, very interesting talking to the two of them. They work in very different fields, but they also um, inspire and push each other and so forth. So we look forward to in, um, uh, having all of you back with us again on August 20th. And then um, on September 17th, Jody Colella and Meryl Camo, uh, both fiber artists, will be talking uh, with them. Uh, another pair that works both together uh, and apart. And then October 15th, Susie Becker and Hillary Price, uh, two cartoonists um, who also, uh, Susie Becker uh, is also um, to continue picking up Ronnie's theme, an absolute animal lover. Uh, and she will be sharing with us her cats and dogs and other obsessions. And that should be a very fun conversation as well. Mm -hmm. So again, thank you all very much uh, for joining us. And I hope 
that you will join us again in another month. Good evening. Take care.